Today we have with us Richard Way and uh, Stanford Johnson, and I want to read a little bio about each of them. But Richard is a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army Air Force, retired. He's also a retired commercial airline pilot, University of Tennessee graduate, Tennessee Air National Guard member, and I suppose retired from there as well, and uh, an avid historian. And he and his wife, Debbie, have three children and four grandchildren, and they now live in towns, I guess you what we call it, Club County. So, uh, Stanford Johnson is also a former decorated United States Army officer, University of North Georgia graduate, United Methodist senior pastor, East Tennessee native, and member of the First Families of Tennessee. And he's a distinguished author and editor, and his recent publication is Our Little Secret. And to, together, today we're going to hear of both of these publications, and uh, I'd like for us now to welcome them as our presenters today. I appreciate everyone coming today. Uh, just a little bit about my history. We were asked uh, to cover the four projects that we've been involved with. And a little bit about my history is that in the 50s, my father helped a Kermit Hunter gather the information for both Unto These Hills and Chucky Jack. My family, my brother, my mother, dad, and me were in Chucky Jack for four years, and my dad directed it. So I spent a lot of time as a little kid running around with my father gathering information both in Cherokee and all over this area. And then uh, as I grew older, I became a union musician and I played on the Kaz Walker show. So I got to know Kaz Walker really well and he enlightened me on a lot of subjects, which we'll get into later. And then after that, I went in the Air Force and I was in the Air Force and National Guard for 23 years as a pilot. Uh, I had a unique experience in the airplanes that I got to fly. I had three tours in Southeast Asia. I flew uh, KC-135s, which are refueling, uh, EC-135s, which are electronic warfare, and RCs, which refuel the spooky airplanes, the, the uh, different airplanes that, that use a unique kind of gas. I uh, also got a uh, type rating in the Air Force of a Boeing uh, 707-300. So I, I had three tours in Southeast Asia, and the entire time, it started in 69, I had a camera with me, and I took pictures, always. And I forgot how many pictures I took, but if I had the money that it took to develop those 35 millimeter pictures and to purchase them, I'd be a lot wealthier now than I am today. But with enough of that said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into to the two books that are current, but I just wanna give you a background uh, the first book, because Kaz Walker talked to me so much about the white caps and blue bills, and I don't know if y'all realize that Walker's, that Kaz Walker's family was from Sevierville. They moved to Kentucky to get away from the white caps, and uh, uh, Mr. Walker worked in the coal mines. Kaz came back to Knoxville, eventually started the grocery stores. Raccoon Valley was the first store in Knoxville on Central Avenue. But, he enlightened me a lot uh, about history. Of course, with the experience of my dad, I learned more and more, and I got more interested in history. Well, then, of course, the flight book was the second edition. Now, the Eyes of Midnight, what I did is, uh, this is the first book that we wrote, uh, and I say we always because I have someone always help me write the books. I'm dyslexic. I never tell anybody that because it didn't give a lot of confidence to the people that were flying with me in the airlines. <laughs> but with that said, uh, I had a Bob Wilson help me write this book. Bob was an investigative reporter with uh, a couple of newspapers. He was with the New Sentinel. And the information that I gathered, I got it all together. And one of the other things that we had done is that I, my wife is here somewhere. But uh, she and I started the Great Smoky Mountain Heritage Center. And uh, she created the Guild, and I created the Board of Directors with the help of an enormous number of wonderful people. While I was doing that, 
information came through these people that they knew about the white caps and they knew a lot about the white caps, various volunteers at the Heritage Center, which when I put it together, a lot of the dates, names, places didn't quite match. So that got my curiosity up. So the uh, first book I tried to write was this one, Eyes of Midnight. Uh, Judge Wade uh, wrote the forward in the book, and he said at the time that was the most in-depth, accurate account of the White Caps of the Then later on, I ended up in getting all those photographs I was telling you about, and I produced a book that has 104 photos in it. And uh, I've got this is the cover of the book because we refueled Air Force One uh, numerous times. This was when I was in the Guard unit. But I also went, uh, I was one of the few people that got to fly in what they called Linebacker One and Linebacker Two. Those two, uh, and this is my training, I always like to show that because the, the key thing to that is always keep the blue side up and you realize that a lot of times you don't get to do that. But uh, this was my uh, training film. I've just taken four pictures out of the book. Uh, the next one is I, I also worked with the Blue Angels. I uh, took them out down into South America for a month. And uh, this is one of their photos. They practiced while we flew, but I was in a good position to take photographs. So I've got some tremendous photographs. Uh, then this is linebacker one, and it's what they call a gaggle. Uh, it's when we went into North Vietnam uh, to attack the North. Uh, in some of these pictures, one bit there's a better one. That's linebacker two. Weather was better, so you could see all the airplanes. But there was five tankers with four fighters on each tanker. There was two stacks, five below, five above. So you had a lot of airplanes going in the same direction you hoped. But we enjoyed the experience, and uh, I, I had a fabulous experience in the Air Force and the National Guard out here. Well. With that said, oh, this is a spook, that's a 102. That's my favorite picture. The reason is, that's in Utapau, Thailand, and the day that I took that picture, Nixon stood up in front of Congress and said, we have no spy planes in <laughs> Southeast Asia. <laughs> well, that's a U-2, and I don't think he was on a training flight. But anyway, that's, that's the pictures that I have. Uh, oh, that's me when I was young. Uh, but anyway, with all that said, that's the first two books. Stan is going to take over now and tell you about the two books. One that he wrote, and what I realized is I met Stan, and he was writing this book. <coughs> he had us, my wife and I, proofread it. And we were just astounded at the ability that he has of painting a picture with words. So with what I had experienced with the new people that talked to me about the White Castle Bluebills, we got together and he agreed that he would help write the second edition, which is the farthest picture. The idea though is that he will tell you how in depth we were able to go and we learned a whole lot more than what's in the first book. And we put a lot of heat, put a lot of timelines and people's names together. So I'm going to turn this over now to Stan, and uh, we'll cut that out. And he'll start. Thank you very much. Before I get started, uh, how many of you have read the Crozier book and or uh, Cas Walker's book and or The Eyes of Midnight? Has anyone yet read uh, our book, At the Dead Hours of Midnight? Okay. What? I'm going to talk about um, my novel first. Uh, this, this is history. It's a, it's a historical novel. The story behind this grave marker on the cover of the book marks an actual grave in the woods on a ridge on our farm in Townsend. I'm a Blount County native. When the state of Tennessee was building Rich Mountain Road, Indicates Cove in the 1920s, 
the contractor used some black, or some convicts, convict labor. Some of the workers were black workers. My grandmother was born in 1918, so she was around. She was a small girl when the workers were there building Rich Mountain Road into Cates Cove. Are you familiar with Rich Mountain Road going into Cates Cove? It's a primitive one-way road coming out now. The story that was handed down to me from my earliest years was that one of the workers was shot in the back of the head allegedly for cheating at cards. The killers were going to dump his body in the fill of the road and cover it over with gravel. But my great-great-grandfather objected and let them bury him on a ridge on our farm. So the older I got, the more noble or honorable I thought that act was on behalf on, that my great-great-grandfather had, had uh, done for this man, this black man. So when I was growing up in the 1960s, anybody who knew about the grave called it the N-word grave. You know what I mean when I say the N-word? Okay. So even though that's all I ever heard it called, in my spirit, I thought that was an ugly word. And it turns out I was right. So I made up a story about a little boy who has a cruel, abusive, and racist father, which I did, who grew up and became an alcoholic, which I did. And in the story, he helps a descendant of the murdered black man find out what happened to his great-grandfather. So it's got a lot of interesting twists and turns, and especially at the end, you don't really find out what our little secret is until maybe 20 pages left in the book. Randall asked me, I guess it was last Saturday, if, I, if Richard and I had, had done presentations before, and we had not, but I assured him we, we could put something together. And I asked him how long we had, and he said probably 30 or 40 minutes. And he said, don't worry if you go over, we have one of those hooks like they used on the gong show. And we'll pull you off if you go over your time. Um, I got on the Facebook page for the Smoky Mountain Historical Society. And when I did, I was glad to see that it, it, the mission is to perpetuate the cultural and genealogical and historical or histories of Tennessee counties of Blunt, Cock, and Sevier, which is exactly where I found my connection to White Captain in Sevier County was at the intersection of genealogy and history. Anybody familiar with the, the uh, connection in East Tennessee? I would encourage you if you could find a copy, get one because it is a wealth of information. I met with Inez Burns, Blunt County historian, and Elmer Mize back around the year 2000 when I was trying to establish my qualifications for First Families of Tennessee. And I, I told uh, both Inez and uh, Elmer Myers that I was a direct descendant of John Myers, Captain William Walker, and Daniel Dunn, which is who the book is dedicated to. I met Jim at Wilderness Wildlife Week. An interesting thing about my genealogy is my last name is Johnson, but I'm not kin to any towns and Johnsons. Uh, it's not that I don't want to claim kin with them. Uh, my, great, my grandfather came to uh, East Tennessee during the Depression. He, was, he worked at the CCC camp in Cades Cove. And I told Jim that an oral history and our family was that my grandfather was responsible for planting daffodil bulbs that spell out company 5427 in Cage Cove. So every spring when the daffodils come up, uh, there's a reminder that there was a CCC camp right there near, I, I believe this is the Baptist Church. So that that's more of my uh, connection to East Tennessee history. Now the, the genealogy on my mother's side was, I didn't know nearly as much about my mother's side of the family as I knew about my father's side. 
when I started digging deeper into my, my mother's side of the family, I learned that my mother's 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 mother, that's one of my second great grandmothers, was Nancy Talitha Wynn Ural. She was the older sister of Plez Wynn. Y'all know who Plez Wynn was. Okay, so that's my connection to East Tennessee, or to uh, Sevier County. I'm not, a direct, I'm not in a direct line of Plez Wynn's, but I am his father and his older sister, Nancy Talitha Wynn Ural. So when I met Richard and Debbie in 2018, it was natural for me to be interested in the Eyes of Midnight. So I, I read the Eyes of Midnight and I had, I had some unanswered questions. There, there, to, to me, there were some loose ends in the White Cap story. Uh, so I, re I read the Eyes of Midnight, I read the Crozier book, and I read Kaz Walker's book, and I had unanswered questions. The one thing that I never was able to unravel uh, after having read those three publications was the, the narrative, the narrative that had the original narrative. And that was, it goes something like this, as I understand it, that a group of prostitutes around 1892 moved into Copeland Creek, up above Gallenberg, between uh, Gallenberg and Cosby. A judge, this is a picture of what is believed to be the, the uh, house of ill repute. This is on Copeland Creek, right off of Highway, I guess, 73, going to Cosby. And it's still there. We, Richard, Debbie, and I went last May, and we took pictures of that location. So the narrative went on like this. That a group of prostitutes moved into Copeland Creek, in 1892, a judge complained that he couldn't get convictions against the prostitutes. So either in open court or at a cafe in Sevierville, he basically suggested that the good folks uh, take matters into their own hands. Now that was, to me, that was a lot to have happen in a very short amount of time. So I started looking at, I, I, I subscribed to newspapers.com, which ended up being a terrific resource for us. This is the very first newspaper article that I was able to find that references white capping in Sevier County. This is from January 27th, 1892. So right away, I, I realized that my questions about the timeline were accurate because the prostitutes could not have moved into Emmerich's Cove, Copeland Creek in 1892, and a judge complained that he couldn't get convictions when they're mentioned in a January 1892 newspaper article. So I immediately knew that something uh, Something went right. There was more information to the story that I had, had not been able to locate. There was a resource that we found that we mentioned in, at the dead hours of midnight. In 1988, a master's thesis was written by a man named William Joseph Cummings III. And it was a wealth of information. In that, in, in his newspaper, in his thesis, in his master's thesis, he references the fact that judge that there was some. The, it was believed that the judge who had made those remarks, either in open court or in the cafe in Sevierville, was Judge Hicks. Now, if you've read all, if some, most of you read one, one or more of the stories. This newspaper article, article from 28 March and 29 March, 1897, has Sheriff Tom Davis, or Deputy Sheriff Tom Davis, uh, in print, complaining that he believed Judge Hicks was the person who uh, 
made the comment. He says that Judge Hicks has many friends among the white caps, and furthermore, that the white caps were the outcome of a remark made by Judge Hicks. So all those other publications mention a an unnamed judge, but here we have a newspaper article five years after the, the, the beginning of the organization that names Judge Hicks, and in the next day's newspaper article, they gave Judge Hicks an opportunity to counter that claim. The interesting thing about this is that both newspaper articles say that that encounter in the courtroom happened about seven years earlier. That makes it 1891 or 1890, right? So that moved the timeline even, even further back. So now we're somewhere around 1890, 1891, which gives all the other events time to take place. Circuit Court met in Sevier County in March, July, and September. If the judge complained that he couldn't get convictions, that gave him several sessions, which he said he had not been able to get convictions. So that's the, uh, that's more proof, we believe, that it all started a little bit earlier than had been re previously reported. Uh, now, newspaper articles in and of themselves can have questionable uh, stories in them. But you can't refute the date, and that's the important part to us for this story, is that no matter what the article itself says, it references specific dates. And that changes, that, that more firmly puts the uh, timeline in proper perspective. I mentioned the news, the uh, master's thesis by William Joseph Cummings. So if you're taking notes, or I think we're being recorded, you can look this up on the internet. You can look at this master's thesis by William Joseph Cummings III, published in June 1988. So it's been around a while. In that news, in, in his thesis, very early on, he references another newspaper article that even more firmly establishes uh, some of the timeline. This is a May 1892 article in the Knoxville Tribune. It says the White Cat movement originated in Emmerich's Cove two or three months ago and was headed by two men and a number of married women who sought to take revenge upon men who had proved false to their marriage vows. Nowhere else had I ever read that women were involved in white capping. Everything else I read prior to this newspaper article suggested that Dr. Henderson had been the founder of the Blue Bills. In May 1893, a woman named Mary Breeden and her two of her daughters were whipped. Mary Breeden died in August of 1893 as a result of the wounds inflicted upon her by the Whitecaps. Dr. Henderson went to her aid in August 1893, shortly before she died. And the, the story that I, the narrative that I had encountered prior to this newspaper article suggested that at, because Dr. Henderson was outraged at the brutality that caused Mary Breeden's death, he started the Blue Bills. But he could not have started the Blue Bills in August 1893 if they're mentioned in a newspaper article in May 1892. Now, one of the other big questions I had about the whole White Cap saga was, you know, it, every number, everything I've read suggested there were between 650 and 1,500 white caps. 
So if it originated in Emmerich's Cove in 1892 and effectively ended when uh, Catlett Tipton and Plez Wynn killed the Whaley's in December 1896, that's about five full years. But that's a fairly efficient uh, growth for an organization in a county that had 20,000 people and 4,000 voting males in, in, that, in that decade of the 1890s. So one of the questions I had was how were they able to uh, grow that much that quickly in such a rural population, mountainous population? The last bullet comment on this newspaper article gives a hint where it says, it's whispered that the leader of the gang is a justice of the peace. Now that, that's a big deal. In the master's thesis by William Joseph Cummings, I, I pulled out some quotes of his that may explain why the white caps, what I call, or in our book, metastasized in Sevier County. Because they effectively spread throughout all the, the civil districts in Sevier County. Cummings said that shortly after the Sharavari of the prostitutes in Emmerich's Cove, which was uh, whip, whipping them out, uh, they thought that the, the, the immorality, they could uphold the Victorian morals of the time uh, if they just took a bundle of switches to the women and threatened them with the, whip, with the whipping. They threatened them, the prostitutes didn't leave, so they went back and whipped the prostitutes and they left. So that's what that means. But where this, take, where this whole saga takes an interesting turn is it says that white cap gangs were organized by justices of the peace. Now, the, now the, the image, the whole picture of, of how white capping spread throughout Sevier County, I think starts becoming a little clearer. Goes on to say that within, within a short time, white cap gangs were being sponsored by wealthy farmers. So on the one hand, you have white cap gangs being organized by justices of the peace. And on the other hand, you have them being sponsored by wealthy farmers who helped the vigilantes by guaranteeing their bail and providing counsel during court proceedings. What Richard and I came to believe was that the white capping that spread, uh, the nature of white capping changed very, very early on from the upholding of Victorian morals to uh, a means and method, method for landowners to deal with unruly tenants and there's even some evidence that uh, some white capping took place that made people leave their farms in Sevier County. I, I reference in the book that I know a Methodist preacher whose grandfather came to Blount County from Sevier County in the early 1900s and he's from one of those prominent families whose name uh, is associated with white capping. But his grandfather said he couldn't get property in Sevier County. So that led me to believe that maybe this man's grandfather was on the wrong side of white capping or on the right side of justice. Now, what's the significance of the justices of the peace? And you've probably heard, if you've read any of these other publications, that uh, white caps managed to infiltrate grand juries. And has anyone heard that? That they couldn't get convictions because they would plant white caps on grand juries. Well, I didn't understand how they were able to do that until I read this. this uh, master's thesis and it really explained to me in more detail what actually happened. In Sevier County, justices of the peace represented civil districts in the county court. So the county court was made up by justices of the peace 
two justices from each civil district and then three from the county seat which would have been severe that was your county court it says that in severe county a grand jury of 13 men usually impaneled by the county court listened to testimony to determine if evidence existed there is your mechanism if justices of the peace made up the county court and the county court and panel grand juries that's how they got white caps on grand juries now one other question that Richard and I had about the origins of white caps and blue bills in Sevier County after we saw the newspaper article from May 1892 that it mentioned the existence of a group called Blue Bills was the role of John Sam Springs in Emmerich's Cove. He was the postmaster there and he's the one from that we borrowed the title for the book. Uh, he said any man or set of men who would go at the dead hours of midnight under the cover of darkness, mass themselves and drag poor defenseless women from into the night and beat them as a base coward and not worthy of citizenship. So we felt like John Sam Springs played a, a, a key role in the eradication of white capping in particular in severe count in uh, Emmerich's Cove. There's no evidence, there's a there, the, well, there's one killing in, in April 1892. I believe it was Bruce Llewellyn, or it was either Llewellyn or Williamson, was killed in Emmerich's Cove in April 1892. After that, there are no incidents reported of white capping in Emmerich's Cove. So we feel very strongly that not only did he run them off, he kept them out. The only, it, it, I think in the, the blurb from the Smoky Mountain Historical Society, it said we were going to tell some of the wild stories. Now, the, the one wild story that we found that I had not read anywhere else was, it, was an event that took place in September 1894. Uh, Congressman Houck had made a speech at Jones Cove and had denounced Whitecapping. The next day, he traveled through Emmerich's Cove to a Baptist church in Gatlinburg where he was confronted by Whitecaps. But he, all, he, but he passed through Emmerich's Cove unharmed. And un, he was not harassed in Emmerich's Cove. So we feel like John Sam Springs, you know, in the book we say he essentially bookends the Whitecap saga because he ran him out of Emmerich's Cove in 1892 he was on the he was the foreman of the grand jury who returned a true bill against Bob Catlett in 1897 uh, that if, that's or 1896 that, that started the whole sequence of events where uh, Plez Wynn and Catlett Tipton were paid to kill the Whaleys. Do y'all know where this these markers are in Emmerich's Cove? This is uh, a guy named Dr. Vince Engel. He's a dentist in uh, Meredith. He owns the John Sam Springs Place. Now, Richard, you may have to help me out. Uh, it's on Emmerich Cove Road, off of uh, yeah, Highway right across the bridge. Off right of Highway bridge. 70. Covered bridge? Yeah. No, no. The next bridge down. And, and you turn, and his farm and house is right there on the right. So. Vince Engel still lives, he, he lives at the John Sam Springs homestead, and he's, he's put these markers up. One uh, talks about his contribution to the eradication of white caps in Sevier County. The other one marks the general vicinity of where he's buried. Now, during our research, we, we used uh, resources all over. East Tennessee Historical Society, 
the Hodges uh, Library, the Special Collections Department, the uh, Tennessee Library, State Library and Archives. I already told you about newspapers.com. But we discovered in the Peter Prince collection in the Special Collections Department at UT Library, we, what we believe is an ever before published picture of Laura Whaley. Laura McMahon Whaley. Now, this sketch, the sketch here that is in Cass Walker's book, and I believe it may be in the Crozier book as well, it's obvious that whoever sketched that sketch used that photograph to sketch his sketching. So that, that was a fantastic uh, find for us. And we also, you know who Laura Whaley was? Yeah, okay. Laura, Laura and Bill Whaley were the young couple, and I say young, they were in their late teens, who had got sideways with Bob Catlett, who was a, a wealthy uh, landowner uh, from a prominent family in Sevier County. And, and he used those white capping methods to deal with the, the, the Whaley, or with a guy named uh, Maples, Walter Maples. Bob Catlett had promised Laura Whaley and her husband Bill that they could move in to a cabin. And when they went to move in, Walter Maples and his family were living there. So Catlett went back to Laura Whaley and had her write a white cap note to Walter Maples, telling him if you don't leave, the white caps are going to be paying a visit. Well, they took the note, tacked it on the on the door, and rocked through rocks at the house, the cabin, and shotgunned the cabin. That was how Tom Davis was able to bring Bob Catlett before a grand jury, which normally that would have been a, a petty crime, a misdemeanor. So Bob Catlett, the wealthy, prominent landowner in Sevier County was really incensed that how dare he be dragged into before a grand jury. So they they found a true bill, the grand jury found a true bill against Bob Catlett and before it went to trial he paid Catlett Tipton and Plez Wynn fifty dollars to kill Laura Whaley and her husband Bill Whaley. That that's and that's what effectively ended, most people believe, ended the White Cap saga in Sevier County. I don't know if it did or not. Um, our first chapter in our book, we, we say uh, two bad men are hanged, but were they scapegoats? You have to figure that if, if between 650 and 1500 White Caps were conducting up to a dozen raids a night and only two people paid the price, then somewhere between 648 and 1,498 people breathed a sigh of relief, right? Because these two paid the ultimate price. Now when Plez Wynn and Catlett Tipton kicked in the door to kill Bill and Laura Whaley, her sister was in the room with them. And once again, this is a never before, and we believe, a never before published uh, photograph from the Peter H. Prince collection at UT Special Collections in the Hodges Library. So, Catlett, uh, Bob Cat or uh, Catlett Tipton and Plaz Wynn break in the door. They have masks on that cover their faces. They don't say a word, but they know that Laura Whaley knows why they've come. They've come to kill her. She had a, an infant daughter who'd been born in September, three months prior. She asked, the killers if she could hand her infant daughter to her sister who was in a bed in the same room. They allowed her to do that and then shot both of them in the head with a shotgun. Very brutal uh, murder. But what had happened was even though Plez Wynn had a white cap cover over his face, it's believed that he dropped something on the ground and when he leaned over to pick it up, 
his mask separated from his face and Lizzie Chandler was able to identify him as one of the two who had come, broken in. So those are really the, 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 the new additions to, the, to uh, the Eyes of Midnight. One other, this is, a, this is really an iconic uh, photograph. This is Plez Wynn um, in the river getting baptized at some point before he was hanged. Now, I've read and heard that they didn't know who the minister was when Plez went in, in the water. But it had been, that I, what I've read prior to our research was that uh, Sheriff Tom Davis was in the water with them on the left there. But I included a picture of Millard Fillmore Maples, who was actually the sheriff of Sevier County just before Tom Davis became sheriff. And that's a great likeness, if you ask me. The picture on the left looks an awful lot like the man in the water with uh, Plez Wynn and the minister. And this is a picture of Tom Davis, the sheriff. Who, the, he was the deputy sheriff who became uh, sheriff in Sevier County. One last resource that uh, provided a lot of information was a June, I believe, 2nd, 1929 newspaper article from the Knoxville News Sentinel. And it goes into a lot of detail about the White Cap saga, really 30 years after the fact. It, this, was, this would have been 30, Plez Wynn and Catlett Tipton were killed or hanged, executed on July 5th, 1899. So this is like the 30th anniversary of their execution. So really that, that's all that we've added to the story and I hope you have questions. I'll start out. Okay. I, I, I've always been curious. I've never, and your research may not have revealed anything about this, but I, and maybe I've just been blissfully ignorant. It doesn't seem like the Ku Klux Klan had much activity in this area uh, for one reason or another. One being the fact that, especially in Sevier County, there weren't that many blacks to whoop up on. And so I've always wondered if it's just a lack of the fact that mean people need somebody to be mean to not having anybody else, they decided that they'd gang up and whoop up on some other folks. And so that was one of the drivers for the, the fact that that, that uh, things expanded and grew, like you said. So you start out with a good idea. Let's, right. let's, let's take care of these infamous prostitutes. Mm -hmm. And then well, while we're at it, well, hey, we got hooked up on somebody. And so it got to be one of those things to where it, it continued as mob mentality often does. Mobs will grow. Mm -hmm. Did any of your research uh, expose anything about like that? No. I mean, there were. there's no evidence at all that, that the, the white caps, I mean, I, they can trace their beginnings back to a movement, I believe, in Indiana in the 1830s or 40s. And, and from that original, uh, the genesis of that kind of movement, the Ku Klux Klan came from the same family tree. But the White Caps in Sevier County, there was no evidence ever that any of it was racially motivated. Now, one theory of mine Raise your hand if you've read some of the publications before. Uh, Eyes of Midnight, the Crozier book, Kaz Walker's book. Okay, so in, all, in those publications, they talk about uh, the person who was the leader of the White Caps being called the Chief Mogul or the High Cockalorum. Have you, have you seen those terms? Well, I have a theory, and we talk about it in our book, that that person could have been William Wynn, who was an older brother of Plez Wynn, 
and younger brother of my great-great-grandmother. The reason I'm saying this, Jim, is he was a justice of the peace from a prominent family, and he also was the superintendent, superintendent of the county work farm. So if he's the superintendent of the county work farm, he's going to be in constant contact with the criminal element in Sevier County. My goodness. So I think that he, that's just a theory, plausible for sure, that because of his family connections, his connection to the justice of the peace system in Sevier County, and the fact that he was the superintendent of the county work farm, put him in contact with the criminal element. And he just, they called him uh, Tufts. They became what we call, and, and after dead hours of midnight, we call them a, a, a brood of vipers and den of thieves. That's what they became. Yes, ma'am. In the beginning, when the white came to Washington, is there any evidence that they white capped the clients of the prostitutes? The, the, the what now? That did they white cap the clients of those prostitutes or just the prostitutes? <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, one report out there that says that there, and I can't, I don't, I, there's a lot of unnamed people in the whole story for obvious reasons. But one woman who affiliated herself, I guess, very loosely maybe, with the Blue Bills, claimed to have had children by a white cat. Not, I'm, not that she was one of the prostitutes, but, you know, they, they were up to no good too, I guess. In the first book, there was a doctor that happened to be out visiting home one night, and uh, what happened is, happened to go by a woman that was being strapped to, to a tree. Mm -hmm. This was in the first book. Remember Richard? And she, uh, he said, well, I've got to go back and help that lady. Well, so all, all the guys ran away on their horses and they said, well, Doc knows our horses. You know, they had the covering over their face. You know, and they went back and, and shot him. Okay. We've got a carriage that has yeah, gunshot. Uh, I collected carriages uh, for a long time until my wife said that I had enough. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the carriages I had came with a story from the family. It had uh, two bullet holes in the back of the carriage seat. And where the harlot that had been whipped, uh, she slumped back and the leather was rotted in streaks where she bled and the dock fell forward and he bled out in the carriage. And so the whole floor where he would have been sitting was rotted away. Um, but a lot of that was not, that, that's a family story. And I'm sure that it's based on some sort of facts. But when you can't prove it, we, we don't particularly talk about it. But what we've tried to do, and Stan, I think, has done a great job in it. He's footnoted this book. First one wasn't footnoted. Secondly, he's he's got newspaper articles that are dated, and you, you verify that whatever we're talking about happened because you get to read the newspaper article. Well, the first book, we, it was hard six years ago a lot of this information we found more recent because the different libraries and, and institutions have started collecting and, and disseminating the information that's in them. That one collection of that attorneys had been at UT uh, uh, library for a while <clears throat> and we went over and uh, took 1,100 pictures of documents, paper, pieces of paper but that wasn't it, it was available sort of six years ago but they didn't even know what they had so all the institutions but digitization of information has progressed dramatically 
a lot of these newspaper articles you can find uh, digitized, which weren't years ago. So it, it's easier now to, you know, to prove something is correct. It's hard to prove that it's not correct. Was there much in there uh, by, Pete, <clears throat> by Pete that Prince you had the one picture of hers? Yeah, the two, the, the sisters, Maura Whaley and Lizzie Chandler. He's got a lot of stuff there because I helped move it in. He does. He does indeed. Uh, Not much. Very really disorganized. He said he was 97 percent finished, and they said he was 97 percent started. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> there were been working on a number of books on the smokies, mm -hmm. uh, some of which would be very good, and a place name there. And the only book I know he ever got published was on the Confederate Infantry Company from North Carolina. He was working on some other stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't gone back to look at him. Uh, it sat in the middle of the room for a long time. They were looking for somebody. But it had, he had a lot of severe county and stuff. He died 20 years ago, I guess. Uh, was there, he was an active Methodist at death. Was there any mention of the Baptist and Methodist churches and the other independent churches and what you found on this? No. No, sir. The only mention of any particular church was the Gatlinburg Baptist Church that had the white capping incident around the visit from Congressman Houck. And that really, that, that sounded like a, it said that blood was running in the, in the aisle uh, in the church. The white caps and trotters and a cognal it went to confront uh, Hauk because he had denounced white capping the night before in Jones Cove. And, you know, there's something, I don't think it comes out as much as it probably should in At the Dead Hours of Midnight is, it, it, it's in the newspaper articles a lot. There was, a, there was oftentimes drinking involved. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the killing of the Whaley's, uh, a couple a couple of men, brothers, named Jenkins, owned and operated what was called a blind, a blind tiger, which was a place that distributed or had available uh, bootleg whiskey. This courthouse, I guess you know the history of the courthouse, built in 1896, and that's the year that the Whaley killings took place, December 28, 1896. Plez Wynn and Catlett Tipton were tried twice. Uh, Catlett Tipton was found not guilty at the first trial in November 1897, but in April, eight, March and April 1898, they were both found guilty. Well, Sheriff Maples had a confrontation with William Wynn, the guy I mentioned earlier, and alcohol was involved. It says it in the newspaper article. And out here on one of these streets, there was a livery stable. Jim's pointing over this way. And Sheriff Maples had a confrontation. He felt like uh, William Wynn was going to draw a gun and he shot William Wynn, I think five times, gut shot him five times. Well, William Wynn died on April 7th, I think it was. And on April 8th, when Plez Wynn, his younger brother, was being found guilty of the murders, uh, his brother's funeral procession went by the courthouse while that, that was taking place. And I don't know where in this courthouse that was. But that, that was, to me, was fascinating, that the, the, uh, the white capping involvement in the Wynn family really destroyed that family. And I used to make a joke, I guess, that, you know, my great-great-great-grandfather, Elkanah Mitchell Wynn, who was William Wynn and Les Wynn's father, a uh, Union cavalryman, Captain Elkanah Mitchell Wynn, 
and had been a, a sheriff of Sevier County in 1888 or 1886 to 88, maybe 88 to 90. Uh, sold the farm to try to get his boy off and I think that's true I think he lost the farm trying to save his son's neck but, which didn't happen and, and I mentioned you know uh, John Sam Springs a book ending the whole saga he was the one on the gallows that placed the nooses around the necks of Catlett Tipton and Plez Wynn so He's the one that ran him out of Emmerich's Cove. Uh, we borrowed the title of the book from his quote. He was the uh, foreman in, on the grand jury that found a true bill against Bob Catlett, and he put the nooses around the necks of the two men who were hanged. So uh, I call, or we call, he and we dedicated the book to uh, Thomas Houston Davis, who was the sheriff after Maples and also to John Sam Springs. We call them two genuine Sevier County heroes. So. You? Yes, ma'am. Um, any information on like the Stinches and some of the other law enforcement from Knoxville who supposedly cracked open the case? Somewhere along the way, uh, I, you know, in this newspaper article right here, January, uh, June 2nd, 1929, it, it, the beginning of it is, is at a meeting of white caps and it, 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 ostensibly the leader is talking. Uh, he blames Tom Davis and J.R. Penland I believe Rufus Minot, who was the district attorney from Knoxville, along with Judge Nelson, somebody figured out that they were not going to, Sevier County wasn't going to be able to solve Sevier County's problem. They just wanted, the White Caps had infiltrated the justice of the peace in the court system. There were lawyers. There was a, a, a newspaper editor named Montgomery who they ran what they called a white cap newspaper. He'd been, he'd originally been an editor of the Sevierville Star. When not, when Sevier County reached out to Knox County to get help, uh, he left and started his own newspaper called the Montgomery Vindicator. What I've read suggests that uh, Tom Davis and Sheriff Maples, and there were uh, Deputy McCall, and, and Reader, and there was a Sheriff Fox. They got a lot of help from uh, neighboring counties. Blunt County also. Uh, it, it, it really was the Wild West. And this, it never spread anywhere except in Sevier County. Well, everything I read prior to when we started researching this, suggested that the folks in Sevier County got the idea from what had been happening in Indiana. But I found newspaper articles about white capping uh, in Jellico to the north, okay. and Ducktown to the south, right. and Tullahoma to the southwest, and maybe <coughs> even western North Carolina. So it, the phenomenon itself wasn't that rare. What separates, I think, Sevier County from any other manifestation of the white capping was the degree to which it infiltrated all the court system, the legal system, uh, all those things. But it, it, it was going on in other places, just not to the degree and to the depth that it went on here.
Right. Nobody would admit the fact that they were black parents, the third population were white parents. Right. And the male voting population was 4,000. There was quite a few stories that we've heard and been told. The one is like the church in Maribel was burned by the white cats because it was too liberal. Uh, that's what the people that and uh, you know, descendants of the people that were in that church back then. But you could never find any documentation. trial was moved uh, up to Warston. They got the jury and uh, Stuart Gordon's great, great grandfather. Jay Arthur. Jay, yeah. He, he was the cross uh, attorney. And they got a judge out of Knoxville also. So it, it, a lot of that, you know, was because they couldn't get anyone convicted here or even brought to trial. movement of the trial, and, you know, and that's not, but there's a lot of stories that because it was a secret organization, no one kept notes, and you couldn't prove anything, and that, that's the hardest part of, of trying to do research on something like this. Yes, ma'am. Were the white caps not in Sevierville in the Boyd's Creek area at all? Oh, they were all over Sevier okay. County. Most earlier publications suggest that uh, there were more in the Pigeon Forge area than any of the other civil districts. The Boyd's Creek for sure, Catlett, Catlettsburg, 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 is that right? Uh, that's all out that direction. I think Boyd's Creek, Catlettsburg is one, what, 66 going out to the interstate now? Because I heard that he lived in a attic of a house out there and came out at midnight. Who's this? Of course, I, I thought it was Catlett Tip. I didn't know. I don't know. Okay. I, I, had not, oh, oh, I had not heard that. Rumor. Yeah, sure. I've heard Catlett House is supposed to be connected down there during Forge Creek. I don't know if there's anything to it. No white two story. It's still standing. Yes, it's a white house. Not up on the hill. Yeah, I can. Quick question. Yes, sir. There's a photo in the Sevier County Heritage Museum, mm -hmm. a display of white caps, and the costume is very ornate, mm -hmm. which made me think this was a woman's costume, and what you said, that there were women involved, is it possible that uh, the women had fancier costumes? <laughs> uh, you know, that, the picture of that costume is in Eyes of Midnight, and uh, I was visiting recently I, I don't, that's more of it seems to me, I don't know how that one came into being. It seems more of an anomaly than, than what, that's the, what I thought. The, 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 the typical white cat, how the typical white cat masked himself or herself. Mm -hmm. But I was at the Sevier County, uh, the Rail and Maples, Rail, Rail, Rail and Wilma Maples History Center at the King Family Library recently. and person that works up there, the librarian, said that a white cap costume had been donated to them. Hmm. And I wanted to try to get my hands on that. But it was too short notice. Okay, then let's thank our presenters. <laughs> I hope you'll stay around with us uh, for, the, for our refreshments and, and uh, you're automatically <coughs> members of the organization for a year for this presentation. <laughs>